Greetings fellow game developers, Vadim's here. Let's talk about netcode. Whether or not you choose to use all-in-one netcode solution or poke into low-level transport libraries, you end up realizing that the learning curve between single-player to medium to large multiplayer game is very stiff and different. That's why converting your offline single-player game to multiplayer is often as hard as writing it all from scratch. If you're not familiar with the computer networking basics, I highly recommend you to check out Netcode one-on-one -on -one video. And once you figure out how the data travels to network, just resume this video and we continue on. Let's imagine that we want to implement high-paced shooter with large-scale multiplayer in mind. Suppose we want it to be similar to Battle Royale type of a game with a big map and a player count between 50 to 100 in a single match. With an idea of the scale, we quickly abandon any peer-to-peer -peer kind of hosting because we need our game to be competitive, or at least fair. So first thing we need to learn is, don't trust the player. Always assume the worst, the player will, and try to cheat. The solution is kind of intuitive, we make all game logic and calculation run in a central server and make clients feel like they make everything happen on screen while in reality they just send an input. This is what we call authoritative server. For example, we don't trust the client with the health of the player. A hacked client can modify its local copy of that value and tell the player it has much more health than it actually does. But the server knows it has only small amount left. When the player is attacked, it will die regardless of what a hack client may think. Same thing goes with client position in the world, shooting, casting, spell and pretty much any other interaction which somehow involves other players. So to summarize, a game state is managed by the server alone. Clients send their actions to the server, the server updates the game state periodically and then sends the new game state back to clients who just render it on the screen. But wait! This all seems like a lot of data to transfer. Imagine a map with 100 players all running around and constantly interacting with each other, and the server need to keep them all up to date at any given moment, otherwise making the experience worse for the players. And so we stumble on another question. How do we deal with latency and bandwidth problems? First, by choosing the right network protocol. In case of fast-paced multiplayer, the winner clearly is UDP. And the reason why is that every TCP packet comes with significant overhead compared to UDP. But most importantly is that TCP creates hold of the line blocking problem. And it is brutal to FPS multiplayer experience. And when the question comes between reliable and fast network protocols, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Often or not, we end up implementing our own reliable version of UDP protocol. There is still a couple of things we need to know if you want to squeeze maximum out of server bandwidth. This is where delta compression and various serialization strategies come handy. The whole purpose of this is to squeeze as much information to smallest amounts of bit of data. For more in-depth info on network protocols, you can find link to various articles in the description below. Let's assume that we tackle all the problems mentioned above and implemented our own network protocol solution. We configured our dedicated server, created some basic movement logic, strap up simple client that renders and animate our character, we connect the client to the server and press some movement input. And then, after about 200 milliseconds, our character start to actually move. This perceived lag between your inputs and its consequences may not sound like much, but it is noticeable, and of course, a lag of half of a second isn't just noticeable, it actually makes the game unplayable. Client-side prediction, snapshot interpolation and lag compensation is a solution for these kind of problems. But for all these methods to work, we need to assume that the game logic is deterministic enough, meaning that the same logic we use on the server for moving character, for example, will work exactly the same if we use it in clients. Let's start with the client-side prediction. The process of client-side prediction refers to having the client locally react to user input before the server has acknowledged the input and updated the game state. So instead of waiting for the new game state to start rendering the inputs we sent, we can render the outcome of the inputs as if they had succeeded. While we wait for the server to send a true game state, which 
more often than not, will match the state calculated locally. With this approach implemented, the user will have a flying-like experience, and even if the latency to server is high, the game would feel responsive and lag-free. We still need to synchronize local prediction to the actual server response. Bear in mind that the server is who in charge here, so if we move our character and the server responds what that we cannot do this, we need to correct our local position to the data from the server. And this could lead to bad player experience, the player sees a character moving and then all of a sudden teleports back. But let's consider the more often example. What could actually go wrong is, clients can move character in two different directions before the server approves the first one. This leads to synchronization issues, and the way to fix this is to realize that the client operates in present time, while the server response data is actually the state of the game in the past, and by the time server send the update game state, it hadn't preceded all the commands sent by the clients. We can work around this problem by assigning an ID or sequence number to each request that we send, and then the server return the response, it includes the sequence number of the last input it preceded. So, moving backwards to our previous example with player inputs. When the client send first input, we give it an ID of 1, and the second input would come with ID of 2. After we receive response from server, all we need to do is compare game state with machine sequence number, and this approach should cover basic single player needs. But after all, we're talking about multiplayer games with dozens of player interaction with each other. Sure, each client can predict his own action based on player input, but what do we do with other clients? How can we predict and move enemy players smoothly without knowing their game state for about 100 to 200 milliseconds? The short answer is we can't in real time. But what we can do is show other client positions slightly in the past time. So if a latency between our client and server is 100 milliseconds, we can show the state of other clients with exactly 100 millisecond delay. Now let's take a minute to sync it in our minds and talk about server update cycles. Considering we have on our hand fast-paced multiplayer with tons of clients playing simultaneously, Imagine if server update the world state every time it receives a player input. It would quickly consume too much CPU and bandwidth. A better approach is to queue the client inputs as they receive it, without any processing. Instead, the game world is updated periodically at low frequency, for example 10 times per second. The delay between every update is 100 milliseconds in this case, it's called the time step. In every update loop iteration, all the unprocessed client inputs is applied and the new game state is broadcast to the clients. So, by this example, every client connected to the server receives game state exactly every 100 milliseconds. And this is where we use entity interpolation. When we receive game state update on the client, we interpolate the local data to server data, and by the time interpolation is finished, the new data should arrive. Remember when I told you that the player sees itself in the present, but sees other entities in the past. However, seeing other entities with 100 millisecond delay isn't generally noticeable. But what if a player shoot another player, as he see him on the screen, and by the time server receive information about the shot, the player which has been shot is already moved out of the way. After all, we're basically shooting in the past. This is where lag compensation technique applies. It is not a perfect solution to this problem, but it is a pleasant solution for most players most of the time. And here is how it works. When you shoot, clients send this event to the server with full information, the exact timestamp of your shot and the exact aim of your weapon. Here is where the magic comes in. Since the server gets all the input with timestamps, it can reconstruct the world at any instance in the past. What that means is, it can reconstruct the world exactly as it looked like to any clients at any point in time. This means the server can know exactly what was on your weapon side the instant you shot. It was the past position of your enemy's head, but the server knows it was the position of his head in your present. The server processes shot at that point in time and updates the clients. With this approach everyone is pleased except for your target. That's a trade that we make. 
because you shoot at your enemy in the past, he may still receive shot a few milliseconds after he took cover or hide behind the wall. There is many topics left to cover. How do we manage client and server being deterministic, particularly the physics unit, which is often used random numbers for collision calculations? We also run into problem of floating point determinism. Physics simulation use floating points calculation, and it is considered very difficult to get exactly the same result from floating points calculation on two different machines. People even report different results on the same machine from run to run and between debug and release builds. Other folks say that AMDs give different results to Intel machines. I will link the articles about handling these various problems in the description. So to summarize, I think it is important to know how modern netcode is working, even if you plan on using high-level network solution which may include the same principle I show you. Thank you guys for watching. I am planning on continuing networking series but with the real-world examples. If you're interested in this kind of information, especially if you're using Unity as a game engine, please like and subscribe for more netcode content. Thanks for watching and see you later, game devs.